Today, we will begin a new series called Proofs, where we will go through the various proofs of the validity, not only of the existence of God, but the validity of Jesus being the only way to God and various topics in between. Today's topic will be the foundational one, proofs of the existence of God. First though, if you like what this channel covers and how we do it, please like this video, share, and subscribe. Now, there are books, videos, and presentations the world over about the existence of God from a Judeo-Christian perspective. One thing I have learned in my near 30-year walk with the Lord is that people are not usually convinced of such proofs until God himself moves them to believe such proofs. The flesh is hardened in what it believes. And to some extent, I can understand that. If someone came to me about the falsity of Jesus Christ, I wouldn't pay it too much attention. Why? Because I am convinced in my mind about the validity and divinity of Jesus Christ, the same as many are already convinced of the theory of evolution and billions of years being the origin of humanity. However, to them who have ears to hear, let them hear. Since there are 8 billion humans on the planet at this point, I'm not going to claim authorship over this saying, but one thought occurred to me fairly early on in my years of college after I became a Christian. There are one of two things one must believe in, matter or God. If you believe in the validity of evolution as the origin of all things, ultimately you believe in the eternality of matter as the origin of all things. The contemporary thought is the Big Bang started as a pinpoint of remarkably dense matter that exploded and created all we see today. I remember reading a summary of a paper about how something could indeed come from nothing, from no intelligent design at all. This was tapping into the realm of quantum physics. However, ultimately, matter in this worldview was the quote-unquote uncaused first cause, because in a universe of causality and an understanding that all things had a beginning, we have to start somewhere with something. That thing in this case would be matter. Or if one is a theist and believes that there is a god, we believe that entity to be the uncaused first cause. Now, that's another can of worms that I do not intend to open for this video. For the sake of time, I will say the God of the Bible is the God that is referred to in this video. Followers of these kinds of debates will recognize this as the cosmological argument for the existence of God. The next proof that I would like to argue for the existence of God is that of good and evil. If one believes in the theory of evolution to be the origin of all things, then realistically, morality is relative. There is no standard of good whatsoever. Some have said that whatever is beneficial as a whole to society is what is considered good. However, the theory of evolution is predicated on, quote unquote, the survival of the fittest. That is how, according to that mindset, species have come into being. The weaker iterations of said species should die off so the stronger aspects of a species may survive and that species may move on to more perfectly evolve. Based on that reasoning, shouldn't the lesser people in society be done away with? They're the weaker of the species that are only taking up space and resources, right? Just saying that sounds abhorrent to most everyone. Why? I believe it is because deep down, we know there's an entity out there much higher, bigger, and ridiculously more powerful than we are that would say that's an abhorrent thought. Those who believe in no higher power at all with just the natural order of things being all there is really have no leg to stand on saying that that statement is abhorrent. It actually makes more sense in a strict evolutionary view to do away with weaker people in favor of the stronger. And that is the subject of many dystopian movies and books because deep down, we all know better. History has shown people will rise up and fight against those who would attempt to force that kind of view upon the rest of us. This is also known as the moral argument for the existence of God. God is the standard for good as we wouldn't know any other way. We won't go into the various incidents in the Old Testament, how God shows his sovereignty over creation in ordering deaths for sins committed here and there. That's another video for another day. Ironically, the outrage many believers have towards that topic is yet another proof that God's law is written on our hearts, whether they want to believe it or not. Lastly, we'll talk about the order in the creation that we see. Now, evolutionists will point to a phenomenon called pareidolia, 
According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, this is when humans have the quote-unquote tendency to perceive a specific, often meaningful image in a random image or ambiguous visual pattern. Hence, hence if humans see the design in the natural world, it's a result of pareidolia. Richard Dawkins, an atheist philosopher, made a similar argument in his book called The Blind Watchmaker, basically saying the world only has an appearance of design. It really has none at all, according to folks like Dawkins. Tell that to your cardiologist, or your urologist, or your oncologist. We have doctors who specialize in various systems of the human body because it is so vastly complex, yet usually works in perfect harmony and also completely dependent on the other systems to survive. The body cannot live without the heart, the lungs, the skin, or the brain. Yet each of these systems is vastly complicated, yet each complicated system also works in complete harmony with the human body. The same is true of the ecosystem or the atmosphere of the Earth. Never mind that the scientists have called our place in the galaxy the Goldilocks Zone, meaning we live in a system within the galaxy most hospitable to life. Just more coincidence or quote-unquote appearance of design? This is also called the teleological argument for the existence of God, and realistically, it gets rather ridiculous when you start looking at the science and then coming to the conclusion that it all evolved all on its own. Fundamentally, the reason people don't want to believe in the existence of God isn't a lack of proof. It's that they don't want to believe. It's a heart issue, not an evidentiary issue. The evidence is everywhere. Want to practice some science and test that idea? If you have a Twitter account and want to see what I'm talking about, just tweet something like, the position of the Earth being in the Goldilocks zone just proves atheists completely wrong. They'll come and pounce. You see, atheists on the internet are remarkably evangelical about their atheism. Why? Why does it matter? They would say because theists shape too much policy in the world and need to be opposed. But be careful. They'll attack you from so many different sides, you won't have any meaningful discussion with much of any of them. It's almost like there's a force out there trying to cause as much confusion as possible. Satan is like a defense attorney. He doesn't have to prove you're wrong about the existence of God. He just has to muddy the waters up enough to cause reasonable doubt to keep you from believing. Since God is infinitely more powerful than he is, the only way Satan can war with God is through the beings Jesus died for on the cross. Human beings. Humans are peculiar creatures. God himself could come down visibly and corporeally and show himself to the human race, and you would still have a vast majority still refusing to believe. It's not an evidentiary problem. It's a heart problem. It's a blame problem. At this point in the podcast, I want to reach out to you. And if you have never done so, if you have never entered into a saving relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do that today. All you need to do is believe. Believe that Jesus is who he said he was. He was God in the flesh. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess him as Lord. And the Bible says that you will be saved if you do that. If you truly believe in your heart that he is who he said he was and that he did exactly what he said he would do for you, you will be saved. It is simply that easy. A lot of people say prayer, prayer. And that's great to confess and put your mind and heart and everything through a process, if you will to embody what has already taken place in your heart by simply praying, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And now I confess you as Lord. Please take control of my life and I wanna follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. That's all you need to do and your life will change. Your life will change not so much materially, not so much in terms of the world, but your life will change in your standing before God in that you may know that you can have eternal life. The Apostle John wrote that when he was pinning 1 John. He said, I write these things to you that you may know that you have 
eternal life. Not that you can hope, not that you can wonder, but so that you can know. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast.